It could be years before Bitcoin retraces its previous all-time high again, says our next guest, Patrick Karim of North Star and Bat Charts. Patrick is an expert chart reader. He is a technical analyst, and he is here to break down exactly how to trade Bitcoin and gold and the other assets we'll be covering. Very important lessons we'll be uh, talking about with Patrick. Welcome back to the show. Uh, David, it's an honor. So happy to be back and uh, to try to with you viewers there just to show them what the big picture is unfolding before us. Because a lot of people, they, they're too zoomed in. And I'm here just to show them the big picture and see where the greatest opportunities are going to be uh, going forward. All right. Well, big picture is important. We'll start with that. And then maybe we can drill down to some of the smaller picture traits because people do need to know what to do in the short and medium term as well. So let's talk about the big picture for Bitcoin. Let's start with Bitcoin first. And you're telling me offline that uh, Bitcoin, having traded sideways for a while, isn't going to retrace its previous all-time highs, like my intro uh, suggested. What, what makes you say that, Patrick? Let's take a look at the charts and analyze them together. All right. Well, j just to recap, just the how chart trading could help view viewers understand where they are. This was a chart I did back for Bitcoin. It was uh, it was crazy. It was a laser eyes. It was in uh, February of 2021. Bitcoin was on a tear, but it was getting super stretched from its moving average. And if you look historically, how far an instrument could get away from its moving average, it's like a gauge of uh, fear of missing out, you know, all that extravaganza. And it was really hard to do th this tweet because I was getting a lot of hate. People were like, crypto is the next best thing. It could be, but price action wise, I said, okay, this thing might slow down. So I thought a lot of people would get trapped before between 58K to 64K. So let's fast forward to closer today. Time has moved on. So that pretty much was marked the top, the topping pattern. But because of the sideways consolidation, Bitcoin did have a chance to break out and go back to 120K, but it didn't do it. I have a sleep mode line with many valid trend point touches. And the more the touches, the more it's valid, that trend line. As soon as you break below, that's the market telling you there's a loss of momentum. And that's on a log scale. So if you're breaking down from a rising trend line on a log scale, it's a market telling you there's um, exhaustion. It's it's just it's tired and it's it's starting to f falter down. Capital flows are leaving, and this had a chance here again. It tried to go back above that 200-day moving average around 47k. It couldn't do it, and after that, well, we know what happened, right? It, it broke down, and now there's a huge vacuum here that was identified. It could go down all the way to 12,000, but this yeah. is the lesson. Once you've had these type of meltdowns. Charts don't V-shape recover from that. When you've, when you've broken down 80%, 70%, you need a multitude of time to recuperate. Because remember, there's a whole bunch of back holders that got trapped at 58, 64K, 40K that bought on the way down. Right. Man, they're going to want to break even. They're going to want their whatever, the 10 million they had in Bitcoin. Mm. As soon as it starts going back up, oh, man, I'm going to break even. It's the mentality now. So all that overhead people that bought there, since the pricing go up, they're back holders and their future right. resistance. It could take years for this to move sideways, to evaporate, for these people to give up. Okay, I'll take my loss. I'm out of there. But until that happens, these charts, these patterns, I've seen them over and over. Bitcoin, when it crashed from, I don't know, 2018, it took like two, three years before it did a base and then broke out again. It's the same mm -hmm. thing you have to expect right now. Yes, It's a long consolidation, drag down until people capitulate. And uh, I don't think uh, we're close to that at all. Yeah, uh, your chart makes it very clear with the title, but it's important to know for the viewers watching that this is a lock chart. So it may seem like Bitcoin hasn't corrected much this year, but that's not the case. If you look at a linear chart, Patrick, let's take a look at a linear chart. You can see exactly how much it's gone down relative to the top. Now, my question is uh, for you, Patrick, if you take a look at the big picture again, if you zoom out, you'll see that Bitcoin bottomed at, what, $5,000, $4,500 uh, $4, around 2019. Now, this was a level that uh, has never been seen again since that time. Uh, is it possible for Bitcoin to retrace the previous low in 2019? Because uh, I've been getting all sorts of bearish calls. The lowest I've heard is 3.5K, the worst case wow. scenario, uh, which is actually even lower than the previous low. What do you think? Well, look, that low was possible because the base of volume of people was much lower back in the days. So the previous base, it went up and then it created that base. That low, look at this, this is volume profiling. This is how many transactions were at that price action. There's a lot of support at 12,000 for Bitcoin, a lot. So to, 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 to start looking at 5,000 targets, those are like 
you could flip it. It's like people saying it was going to two million when it was at it was uh, at fifty thousand and gaining steam. People were looking at whatever crazy targets up. On the way down, the same thing. Human emotions, but the tar- the chart is telling me twelve thousand. Of course, like some crazy event could like try to make it seep down through that, but it should bounce in all that area from twelve thousand all the way to uh, five six thousand. It should really really get support from there. So to look at three thousand, that's a target below the support that I see here. So I wouldn't even consider um, those targets until we get closes in the four digits there. It's like, that's too when, far. The prop, It's too far. When you're trying to project how long it would take for Bitcoin to retrace its all-time highs, what sorts of indicators or historical precedents do you look at? I'll just give you a few examples. You talked about how long Bitcoin stayed flat the last time we had a crypto winter, which was, I think, two and a half years. Uh, if you take a look, look at the NASDAQ, for example, which... Uh, has been highly correlated to the Bitcoin price over the last year. The Nasdaq peaked around 2000, and then we had a dot-com bubble bust around 2001, and it stayed flat for more than 10 years following that crash. It didn't rebound to its previous 2000 high until uh, more than 10 years later, Patrick. So if you take a look at what's been very much correlated with the stock, with the, with the Bitcoin price, which is the Nasdaq tech stocks, it's very possible that we could see a 10-year hiatus of the Bitcoin price, right? I'm just speculating here. Yeah, yeah, totally. Agree. This, this is the this is why we have to go to the big picture. Like I mentioned, yeah. The the SPX divided by producer price index, or Nasdaq divided by producer price index, which is inflation. Which there's money supply, and then after that, there's either growth stocks that if the 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 environment is favorable for them, they'll get a chunk of that money supply. And if there's too much inflation, that those price earnings they shrink for whatever reason that money is going to look into commodities, going to look gold, silver, et cetera. So right now there was a turn. There was actually a breakdown for SPX versus produce price index. So back in 2012, uh, 20 or 19, when Bitcoin went crazy up or it didn't stay like down for a long time, the producer, the SPX had not broken down versus a producer price index yet. That's a key element. Now it has, it's broken down versus producer price index, just like you mentioned it, it did in 2000 and 2001, just like it did in the early 70s, just like it did in the, the crash, the great crash of the Great Depression in, in uh, 1930. So right now, the whole the whole game, the, the rules of the game have changed. So you got to expect longer capital flows leaving those growth instruments, and they'll, they're going to definitely underperform all the other hat, hard assets, stuff that you could uh, you could feel, right? You drop it on your toes, it hurts, gold, silver, oil, uranium, all that. The flow is going to start going that. So crypto, definitely the rebound to expect it to do a V-shaped recovery and uh, go back to all-time highs in a, in a timely fashion. Man, it could be long. It could be as long as you said, 10, 12 years. We just don't know how long. But usually, look, I have projections here. If I'm... Yeah, please. The U.S. equities... This is the SPX versus produce price index. For us to have a capitulation low, it could be 2031 before we really bottom, before the SPX really bottoms versus uh, inflation. It could be 2031, 2035, yeah. or 2041 if we repeat what happened in the Great Depression. So it could be a long time. And all these rallies, for me, they're bear market rallies in all US equities, especially uh, technology, growth stocks, all that. Uh, they're all bear market rallies until you see there's an early breakout line until it's able to do a new high. Then the game is uh, uh, you got to sell those rips. OK. All right. Uh, so before we close off on Bitcoin, I want to move on to uh, FTT and gold. So your medium term to long term forecast for Bitcoin then. So give us maybe your one year outlook. And I know beyond one year is it's kind of like throwing the uh, throwing darts at a board. But. You have your tools, so give us your three-year and five-year outlook as well. Well, right, right now it's gonna it's gonna try to find a bottom. So wherever it is, either capitulation bottom, like those crazy targets at uh, three thousand, but uh, unlikely. It's probably gonna base in that ten uh, k range, ten, twelve, eight, six, like stay like that for a long time, and uh, until the SPX or the Nasdaq could get back those capital flows from commodities. Uh, yeah, it could be uh, for, for the next two, three years, it could stay like that. There's probably going to be a violent rally in between that. And usually that's the one that doesn't make it back to all time highs. So some strong rally that goes up, that's going to define the next swing high low. So we had the high at 65,000, then it swings. Maybe it's going to go, I don't know how high it's going to go. Let's say it goes to 35. It's going to create a swing low, but higher, lower. And if you could draw a trend line there, that's the, going to be the trend line that's going to 
tell you when to get back into Bitcoin. So we ha it hasn't even done a swing high yet. So to start morphing that bottom pattern. So you got to let it go. And that, yes, it could definitely be a, at least a year, two years of sideways grind lower until it's able to, uh, to start forming a base. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, Patrick, some people have been to telling me, let's talk about the bullish side now. Some people have been telling me about $100,000 Bitcoin by 2024. Uh, how likely is this target? 5%, 1%. Mm. It's, 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 when I, I hear that, it's, it's total nonsense at this stage. It's like, they're not playing the probabilities. Like, I understand, put a target out, guys, but at least put a chart. Give me, give me some objective evidence that it's possible because what they're describing is a V-shape. If they show me that chart and I would plot that their target on a chart, yeah. it would make me draw a line like that goes like that. Guy, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, guys, for that to happen. There's resistance. There's all these bag holders that have to be wiped out. These are cycles that it's like a sign graph, right? You've seen those all over the yes. human greed cycles. They, they don't just uh, vanish these concepts of human greed and fear cycles. So it's pretty much done. We've had peak, peak Bitcoin, the laser eyes, all that, all the symptoms, all these channels. Talking about crypto, I looked at crypto accounts uh, on Twitter. The, the the smallest one has like four times the number of followers I get. It's like, and there, there's hundreds of these guys. Like, if that's not a, a symptom of a bubble, I, I don't know what it is. I'll give you one. I'll give you one um, reason. This is a more fundamental reason. I know you have a meme to show fundamental versus technical analysis. <laughs> Let's show that later, Patrick. But uh, this is a fundamental reason, and uh, people were looking at historical patterns for Bitcoin. At every single other halving event in history, throughout Bitcoin's history, um, the price has usually jumped in the six months following the halving event. I, we'll, we'll show a chart there for the audience. But uh, if you take a look at when the next halving is set to occur, which is 2024, people, were, people would say to themselves, well, just looking at history, uh, the halving cycle should push prices up again. And so the end of 2024 should see another bull rally because of that. Is that too simplistic a reason? Or do you think there's some merit in drawing a conclusion based on history? I think that conclusion is fine. But they have to take a zoom out because now the, um, the paradigm, now those are, let's say, four-year cycles, eight-year cycles. Now there's a 40-year cycle that has changed, right? So we were in um, SPX breaking down versus PPI. So that halving event is not happening in the, in the bull run for tech stocks, like when SPX broke out versus inflation back in 2011. Now it's yeah. happening in an event where the capital flows are leaving the SPX. So just like I mentioned before, if the capital flows are leaving, no matter how bullish the story is, you're not going to jump as high as you would if the capital flows were, were lifting you up. Just like there's some terrible companies that go up in a bull market. Nobody mentions them. The fundamentals are horrible and um, they still go up. Why, guys? Well, it's because those capital flows are just, there's just so, so much money trying to find a home in a low interest environment and then they go in there. But when that money comes out, even the best fundamentals, the best charity, the best story, they're going to have a hard, hard time. It's headwinds. You don't want to fight, guys. It's a trader. You want stuff with the tailwinds. Uh, let's talk about FTT now, FTX token. But before we jump into that token, I would just want to draw a parallel here. I, how much of the drop in Bitcoin on the 4th of November, the 5th of November, was because of the collapse of FTX? You'll recall that FTT took a nosedive right on the 3rd of November, right around the time Binance started dumping it. How much of that was contagion from FTX into Bitcoin? Or did they act independently, do you think? Well, these type of events, they uh, on the smaller time frames, there could be some uh, synergy, right? Some people mm -hmm. read the news and then decide to to move their money. Maybe the like the retail, maybe some little bigger funds. Also, they start reacting. But the the, uh, the advantage of chart trading is when you zoom out, you get to see the movement of like the bigger funds where they can't react on a dime. Oh, something's happening to FTX. Well, they can't maybe pull the same day, right? They might pull later, creating eventual resistance or selling drops a little later on. But for that particular day, of course, when the, the money flows leave uh, the cryptos, all the cryptos probably on the board, even the ones that didn't weren't attached to that, they probably also had a drop, right? Yeah, makes sense. This chart shows that uh, FTT was already facing some sort of uh, technical troubles, shall we say, even before the collapse of the firm. Uh, tell us about this chart. Yeah. Look, I, I know, guys, you don't want to hear I told you so, but... <laughs> It's the charts. I didn't even know about uh, FTT and uh, all that until I, I started uh, hearing the media news. It was all over the place. Yeah. 
look, I look, I, I look at this chart. It closed below that 12 month moving average back in November of 2021 and December of 2021. Already the momentum was slowing down, just like I showed on the previous Bitcoin chart. When momentum slows down, guys, you step out because you're at risk. If momentum slows down, it doesn't mean it's going to re-pick up and get, give you some great gains. If it's slowing down for a reason. Market needs a breather. It could actually go down. You want to get out of there. There's opportunity costs, all that. So you had, you had a warning sign back in 2021 to not hold that token. And in June of 2022, it closed on a monthly close basis below an important low. That was it. Once you close that, I wrote super skittish below this line. I said, it's a time bomb. Yes, it could go up. It has to go back above the 12-month moving average. It has to show to you that capital flows. They want this thing to survive. But look at that. Five months later, kaboom. There was no reason to hold that FTX token like for the past six months, no reason at all. So people, please look at charts, look at the evidence. I know fundamental stories that you could spin it in a great way. That's fine. But if the capital flows are leaving, you don't want to lose all your money. And this thing might never, like this thing is going to need, I don't even know if they're, they're is it going to come back, David, this token? I'm not even sure. <laughs> no, this is dead. This is, this is gone. Oh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's lost in the ether. Uh, but I mean, let me just, provide a counter argument to what you just said. That trend line that you pointed out for FTT, that could be applied to basically any risk asset during that period, right? Or, or, or am I wrong? Uh, to any. Everything to any. was going down during that. Everything was going down during that time. Yes. Right? Yeah. So that's that brings another important point. It's uh, I have a, a chart there. I have Bitcoin overlaid with Shopify. I compared Bitcoin to Shopify. Interesting. And that's why fundamentals, they don't quite matter in the sense that in the pyramid of investment or trading, or well, investment probably, Capital flows defined by the battle of the main assets. So like growth stocks versus commodities or versus gold. They decide everything that happens under because Patrick, you, you could tell me Shopify, it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Like, I don't care that the charts look alike. Well, when the capital flows, they leave, they create these chart patterns that all look alike. So if you're bearish Bitcoin, you have to be bearish Shopify, even if the fundamentals are two completely different things, right? And you have to be bearish all these other instruments that have the same resembling chart pattern. You have to respect the price action that the market's telling you. So yes, those trend lines, they apply to anything. They apply to gold, silver, anything you want. If the momentum's slowing down, just, just step on the side, guys. You control the money you have, right? Don't let the market decide, hold you hostage because the story is really like... A, captivating and it hits a, like a heart, like people get emotional. You, you got to stay away from that. I don't mean to uh, get sidetracked here, but I was watching the news yesterday and Shopify was recording uh, record sales during Black Friday. More than, uh, yeah, it was just, just, I can't remember the number exactly, but millions of dollars spent in one day in a time when people think there was a recession, right? And then I was looking at retail sales, for example, we'll pull up a retail sales chart. And uh, retail sales in the US just, uh, keep breaking new all-time highs. I, I've actually tweeted this. People have pointed out that adjusted for inflation, perhaps the year-on-year -year growth is, uh, in real terms, perhaps uh, not, not positive. But uh, still, in, in, in nominal terms, people are still spending a lot of money. So how do you factor that into your analysis? Do you think capital will come back to the tech side and perhaps push, push uh, Bitcoin back up if you assume the correlation still remains? They, there's not enough capital to come back. So right now, what the price action is telling you is the plethora of fundamental metrics, like you described, sales, earnings, all, all that stuff, all the and the thousands of analysts behind that look at those numbers and they're they're recommending their hedge fund billionaire pension funds to buy this or not buy that. That aggregate of all that, that's what is creating the price chart. The truth is what you see, right? The price. So even if there's a story where Oh, they're selling more, they're selling more. Well, maybe the capital flows are still leaving because they want, uh, there's so much more inflation and they, they're discounting the next five years of earnings that whatever's happening now, the market doesn't think that thing's going back to uh, all time highs. Mm -hmm. Nothing justifies the price to earning multiples. Who, like, it's, it's very hard because people, at, they, they get attached to these fundamental metrics, but are you smarter than all the thousands of analysts? together, all those, those crazy minds that analyze all that. So it's super dangerous to look at one piece of element, fundamental metric, and try to justify why the price action has to go up. The price action um, does not have to, to go up. Yeah.
Very good. I, I just want to come back to my uh, Shop, Shopify statement. I have the stats here. So it's not just it's right. not just uh, uh, the 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 dollar per, the dollar value of sales that went up. It's the actual number of consumers that bought during Black Friday. So Shopify said more than 52 million consumers globally purchased from the brands powered by Shopify this year, which was up 18 percent from last year's Black Friday. Uh, you can look at it both ways. You can say that sales is going strong, or you can look at it another way and say that the economy is weakened and everyone's waiting for Black Friday to buy things on a discount because they have no more money to buy things at a regular price. You can see it both ways, right? Yes, and th that's exactly the point. I, I remember you could spin a story any which way. I could take a, a, a bullish metric yeah. and in a bear market, it'll be spin, ah, uh, despite, uh, despite these great sales, markets still frown on Shopify. Or... You could take a bearish news and put it in a bull market. Uh, market shrugs off uh, bad sales in a bull market. You know, it's like it's uh, you could spin the, this information left and right. So you you can't trade news like that. You just can't. It's very you difficult. Have a, I you can't have a, you have a meme. I just want to spend one minute talking about uh, your philosophy behind technical analysis versus fundamental analysis. Yeah, what's up with that? There's a lot of people that uh, have done very well. Uh, investing fundamentally or trading even, yeah. um, but uh, you have a different outlook. Tell us about uh, your rationale for posting this. Well, look, the people who did very well, It's they have to do well because the price moved in their direction. So okay. they could have done, they could have had bad fundamentals. Uh, they could have had uh, like the best fundamentals, but when SPX breaks down versus PPI, those fundamentals won't matter anymore. And who who remembers SPX breaking down versus PPI. The last time it happened was in uh, 2000 and in 1970. So if people are do have done well for the past 10, 12 years, their game plan might not be as effective going forward in the next 10 years. They're going to have to to adapt because whatever they thought were good metrics in a bull market, like I don't want to put everybody in the bucket, but you know everybody looks like 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 a genius in a bull market, right? Throw a dart, That's choose right. any tech stock in the past 10 years. I look great. Choose any crypto, man. Hey guys. You know, so you, this this is paradigm shift time. This is every the capital flows are shifting because of the sustained inflation. So people got to be really worried, really aware of the charts okay. and listen to them because the, the game plan that worked for them for the past 10 years or the, the past 40 years from the 1980s all the way to today, that game plan is, 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 a, is changing right now. Hmm. How does one trade charts then if uh, you have such uncertain global macroeconomic uh, um, backdrops. Uh, you know, I, I know that uh, charts, like you just explained, the charts are supposed to tell you the full picture within the prices themselves, but there's so much uncertainty that could push prices in either direction any one such way. Even without looking at the news, you would, don't you still feel this fear and uncertainty in the sentiment of the charts right now? How would you respond to this? The, the, the capital flows, look, these events, or let's say it's a daily event, it's a news, or let's say it's a monthly event, a war, or a yearly event, like a long-lasting war. These capital flow shifts, they last decades. So the type of news that would impact these type of um, capital flow shifts, let's say leaving the growth stocks towards commodities, they aren't decided on events that I see in the news or that I can remember. It's the aggregate of them is so powerful. It's Let's say it's a combination of excessive money printing, add on to that inflation, add on to that debt, add on to that US dollar weakness, mm -hmm. put all that together, these huge events. It's like, it's not one, there'll be multiple presidents in, in this stuff. You know, it's not one administration pushing that stuff. So these huge capital flows, my job is a forest to tree approach, spot the major pendulum swings. That's step number one, make sure I'm in the correct one. So once I know that, look, that's a hundred year chart I have of the SPX versus the producer price index. These singles have happened one, two, three previous times. So I'm definitely not going to want to fight that. And there's okay. no single day event or monthly event that's going to override that. And you know what? The pendulum swing, because we're humans and it's going to swing excessive, just like we had bubbles in US equities. We're going to have bubbles and commodities on the other way. And until, until... Um, my Twitter feed starts getting spammed by, oh, buy gold, follow this guy. He's a, he's a gold guru. Now it's, I'm still getting crypto, crypto uh, bots all the time. So until we start getting gold, gold bots on Twitter, it's like, 
and la- laser eyes for Twitter until we get a Michael Saylor. Who's our Michael Saylor in the gold and silver community? Who's going to be? Is it Peter Schiff? I don't, I'm not sure. But until we have a guy like that and we have a hundred of those guys, uh, the pendulum swing, no matter what the news is, they, they haven't swung fully in the excess in the other direction. Interesting. So I'm not too worried about uh, those, those daily events. I think the, the tides in place are way bigger than any headline news we could have right now. Mm. Okay. Uh, I just want to touch on this chart before we move on to uh, gold finally. We are witnessing another massive momentum structure breakdown for SPS, SPX. So the uh, S&P 500 versus the PPI, producer price index. Expect many years before we see true capil- capitulation bottom. Briefly explain to us the relationship between the PPI and the spider over the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, the produce price index is the cost to, to produce anything. And it's a lot of the energy component. It's, uh, it looks a lot like the inflation chart. I like it because I have 100 years of data. It's less hedonics adjusted than the CPI. And here I have the distance from the seven-year moving average. So just like I did, I showed on the Bitcoin chart, the further you are away from a moving average, eventually that means there's excess and there's a reversion to mean it's you went too far in the one direction. So here's a zero line. So this is how far... When he hit this bottom line here, that's the SPX being way too undervalued versus produced price index. It has sunk too fast, too, too long, and there's a bounce. Look, it, it's just crossing. It's just closing below its seven-year moving average SPX versus produced price index. Hmm. And all the bottoms we've had in U.S. growth stocks or U.S. stocks, they happen when we hit that bottom rail, when there's excess of when people say death of U.S. equities, like they said in 1980 or death of US equities, maybe in 2011, like at these important bottoms in US stocks, we're not there yet. It's like, when you take a step back, people say, oh, people are t- on Twitter, they're too bearish to US equities or too bearish bit- Bitcoin, it has to go up. Well, maybe on that small time frame. but when we take a step back on the yes. ma- mutual funds have not capitulated yet. Huge, huge funds have not capitulated yet. Uh, look, until Newsweek says death of US equities and death of all that, this stuff there, this, this, the angle here is like at least 2031, 2035, 2041, if we repeat, you know, the Great Depression. So I don't know how long until we, there's capitulation, but we're really, really not there yet, guys. Okay. Like on, on this time frame, we're not close to a bottom at all. All right. Grim news again. Let's maybe finish off as, Finish off on some good news, if there is any good news. Is there good news in the gold market, Patrick? <laughs> Let's talk about that space. If there isn't, that's okay. I just I don't want to steer you in either direction. I'm just uh, no. I'm just saying everyone's been depressed about the markets. Well, this this is great in the sense that people have not have been discounting gold for a while, and gold. So right now, those capital flows, like I explained it, gold. I'm monitoring every single day gold versus SPX, and it's about to break out, or it's at least going to try. There's a clear, clear breakout line, just like here from 1980 all the way to 2002. That's gold versus SPX. So when gold can outperform SPX, silver is going to go bonkers. The miners, even miners with no mining permits are going to go bonkers. Like we're really, really, really close. We're, we're on the line. Essentially, this is the golden ratio, uh, David. When gold is worth half of SPX, so a ratio of 0.5. So let's say uh, SPX at 3,400, gold at 1,700, or SPX at 3,600, gold at 1,800. Once gold's above that 0.05, then we're super close to gold time. And look, we're like in 2001, two now, US equities are rolling over. But uh, the, the place to be, definitely gold, silver, uh, uranium. This is definitely, definitely the place to be in the, the next eight years there. Like unless the charts completely prove me wrong and the SPX decides to break out versus PPI, right now your market's bias bearish, commodities bias bullish, but once we get a confirmed breakout, I'll be shouting. I'll be like, uh, did you see this tweet I did? It's uh, I put a chart of uh, SPX versus gold and then there's just a crowd okay. going nuts. Anyways. That's huh. that's the reaction of the gold uh, gold crowd there. Once we break out versus SPX, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's let's organize that party as soon as gold breaks out. I'll be among that crowd as well. I'll join you. Grab a pint. Uh, thank you so much, Patrick. Great talk today. Great analysis. I'll have you back again soon. Thank you, David. It was an honor. Thank you, and thank you for watching Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay tuned for more.